nostalgia, memories, growing up in Central Florida in the 1990s. What a bunch of sappy crap. It's the Sappy Crap Podcast. Starring Steve Bauman and Jarman Day. Welcome to the Sappy Crap Podcast, where the names are changed, but the stories are real. I'm Jarman. I'm Steve. That's right. The stories are real, at least how our very dusty brains have kept them all of these years. That's right. And uh, this week we are talking about our lovely teachers of times past, the good, the bad and the ugly. I I guess we won't say ugly. Right. So put on your thinking caps (laughs) and sit in alphabetical order, kids. Oh, yeah. That's right. We're going to talk about teachers. So, German, a question to open this up. Mm -hmm. What's the earliest teacher that you remember? I was going to say earliest teacher had an impact on you, but if you remember them, they had some impact Then they had an impact on you. (laughs) Well, I have a funny answer and then a true answer. Uh, The fun answer is that my first teacher I remember is my sister. Um, Okay. Because when I was little, she's known she's wanted to be a teacher her entire life. And that's a very rare thing where you just know what job you want and you got that job and you're still doing it. Um, So when I was very little, She would have me before I was even in school. And I have memories, vague memories of this sitting me in a chair and giving me a workbook and saying, teaching me to do it. And like she was the teacher and I was the student. We had to role play and pretend we were doing those things. And And she'd hit you with a ruler. (laughs) It was a Catholic school. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And uh, she taught me how to write my name and all this stuff. She was like teaching me real things that actually kind of helped me once I got into, um, you know, elementary school and stuff. But then the real answer, I guess, would be I do remember vague memories, not just from pictures, but of my elementary school teacher. Her name is Miss Stackfleth, which I've never heard of seen that name since. Um, but just remember her being genuinely sweet and kind with this nice smile. And I was scared to be there, but just having this kind presence around. And she was just nice to everyone. I was like, and it was very easy for me to adjust into school life because of her. And so thank you, Miss Stackfleth, wherever you are. I'm mean, use her real name because it's a wonderful thing. And I hope she hears this. That's fair. Uh, yeah. Uh, what about you, Steve? Uh, for me, it was my first male teacher, uh, the fourth grade man named Mr. Wagner at Herbert Hoover Elementary School. Oh, and he was sort of a rare breed in that he was uh, an established male teacher in a time where there weren't a ton of male teachers mm-hmm. um, when it was still very much a, a female dominated profession. So I remember him talking about that, how it was like very unusual and a lot of people really questioned his choices. Right. To become a teacher. Uh, and I remember he just had very creative projects. Uh, so we got to build like models of these airplanes out of toothpicks and foam. And then we had to fly them and have a competition. And we did this thing called a dinorama where we had to make a dinosaur scene in a box. Cool. And then we had to do flashcards and dinosaurs. And, and so those are the things I remember sort of the, the projects and things that, that weren't what I'd done before. And really haven't done since. Yeah. Some, and there's, there was a teacher kind of like that in our, our middle school, I believe. A guy with a beard. And he had a class that I don't really know what the name of the class would have been. But they built oh, rockets and stuff. Oh, my gosh. That's a great reminder. I totally forgot about that. Mr. Harrow. Mr. Harrow. Yeah. Was his name. He ran. It was called like science, exploring science and technology or something like that. It was a super elective. I took it. Oh, you got lucky because like, it was hard to get into. I was one of his favorites. Oh, that's I was great. one of his absolute favorites. And he gave me some goofy special assignment that was really difficult. <laughs> but yeah, I remember we had to do, everybody had a time period. And so we had to build a model of a house from that time period. And then we'd had, we had to share a snack or meal with a class from that time period. So we got the medieval times. So we had to build a model of a castle and a helmet. Hmm. And then we made like a stew. <laughs> and I remember I did all of it. I did everything. Oh, in your group? Oh, my God. Did I do everything? I remember. That yes. happens a lot. I yes. remember um, Mr. Harrow being is his classroom being like a big workshop. And somehow he was busy, probably been there for a long time. So he had so much stuff in that classroom and bicycles hanging from the ceiling, yeah. like big fiberglass panels laid up against walls and stuff. Half finished boats. And he reminded me of like Jack Black kind of energy because he was always just moving around. He had a lot of energy. He was happy and 
he would come into my social studies class, I think because he probably had a crush on my social studies teacher at the time, Miss Mayer. Um, and he'd come <laughs> in and he would just like chat with us and joke around for a while and she would just be blushing and stuff. And then he'd be like a whirlwind and then he'd run out of the class. And then I think at one point he did a rocket, a little model rockets thing for his class. And everyone from the school was able to come out and watch the rocket launches if they wanted to. Um, he was just what an incredible guy. You know, I didn't have his class, but everyone knew him at the school because he was so unique oh, yeah. and energetic. And and, I had completely yeah. forgotten about him until this moment, but you're absolutely right. He was super eccentric. And, and I remember he, we had this like independent study thing for the second half of his class, like the second quarter of his class. And, he, and I didn't know what to do. And he like, he was like, why don't you build a model of the Nautilus submarine? <laughs> and I was like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> so like he gave me no context and no real guidance with the exception of one or two things. And I remember setting about trying to build like a one tenth replica of the Nautilus submarine and just not knowing what I was doing and maybe completing a fifth of it. Maybe. <laughs> but who has independent study in middle school? That's pretty awesome. Right. It was really it was strange. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, but he, that's another because you said as soon as you said that that teacher in fourth grade that you had it reminds me of him because that was kind of things he would do those kind of activities. Um, but I had a wonderful Miss Bacon in third grade, uh, and that was over at Hidden Oaks Elementary School, which we've mentioned on the podcast before, is where I went to school with uh, Casey Anthony, um, the famed person who allegedly murdered her daughter. So that was that was interesting. But uh, and then after that went to fifth grade. Uh, we're not talking about school in general here, but that's where I, Steve and I started going to the same school in that track. So yeah, uh, Brookshire fifth- Elementary Bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> so we come from our elementary school, middle school, and high school. We're all together from that point on. Uh, hence the premise of this podcast. Uh, we were able to talk about but these things. German and I had the same teacher in the fifth grade. The German, you were in like some advanced class thing where you would split off for part of the week. I did the gifted classes thing would split off yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But what was the teacher uh, we had in common? I don't remember names. Miss Fry. Oh, I vaguely remember that. And she's got to be retired by now. I mean, God, it's been 20 years. Yeah, gosh, it has. Um, and so I'll, I'll say uh, Miss like Fry and years. I did not get along. Oh, I see. She did not like me a tremendous amount. She had run two other boys out of the class already that year. Wow. Whose parents had pulled them or she had basically kicked out. And. I remember, do you remember junior achievement? It sounds familiar. It was like college kids came in and did workshops with us on like how industry works. Oh, it vaguely sounds familiar. Yeah. And there was one where we were putting together fake commercials for something. Ooh. Uh, I think ours was car insurance. Everyone had a different thing. You had to come up with a 20 second or 30 second skit, skit that was acted as a commercial. And I was doing sound effects while the other kids acted it out. And I was very much in my element because I hadn't really figured out I was a theater kid yet. Right. So I was enjoying myself and getting into it and directing and helping. And I remember I had to do this sound effect that was like a screeching of tires when it came to a halt. And I did it while we were rehearsing and Miss Fry like yelled at me to stop screaming. And I literally, I remember legitimately not understanding what she was talking about. (laughs) I was like, I wasn't screaming. What do you? okay i mean i'll stop and then we did it again and she like threw me out of the class and came out and balled me out what do you mean balled you out what does that mean like just just told me that i couldn't participate the rest of the class i was not going to be able to be in the sketch oh and i needed to wait there and so like i'm outside of the classroom blubbering like a blubbering like a baby well yeah we're only in fifth grade i was <laughs> and i was but and i was like i wasn't doing anything like i legitimately at the, like i get it now kind of but even at the time I remember thinking, like, I didn't do anything. I was doing the assignment. Right. Um, And the principal came by and saw me, came out and was like, are you okay? And I was like, oh, thank God an adult is here that's going to, (laughs) like, that's going to ease this over a little bit. Hopefully. I remember she went in and talked to Miss Fry and came out and she looked at me and pointed her finger and she went, behave, and walked away. Oh. And I was like, what the (laughs) fuck? So, like, my only anchor was gone. Oh, no. Gone. And so I remember I had to sit out the rest of the class and then I got to miss like recess that day. Mm. And during recess, Miss Fry made me write a letter to my parents. They do this so often. Telling them what I had done wrong. And I like, and I at the time legitimately didn't understand. Hmm. And so I wrote a letter to my parents in which I said, like, I'm sorry, I'm a bad kid. (laughs) And she signed it. And had me take it home to my parents, and they told me that they needed to sign it too. Ugh. 
Well, my dad read this. I mind you, I come home just blubbering and crying. Hmm. I, I'm in such bad shape that I just get sent to the nurse's office who sends me home. Wow. For being sick. But really, I'd just been crying so hard that I had like a temperature of 100. Jeez. Um, and so my parents think you have to read this letter. And my dad immediately calls the school. My mom starts looking up private schools. Oh, my goodness. Like legit starts. Like, I'm glad you, you parents, didn't do that. <laughs> my parents immediately go to the stance of he's not going back into that classroom. Hmm. Like that was their hard line. And we went, we met with the principal the next day. I did not go to school and Miss Fry was there. And I remember my dad just bawling out the principal, bawling out Miss Fry. And then Miss Fry left and we continued to talk to the principal. And I remember my dad telling the principal, and I think I told this at his retirement party that he's like, you know, my kid is not a bad kid for a teacher to allow a student to write that about themselves and then sign it as an approval of that statement is unacceptable and if i had seen her in the parking lot that afternoon i would have run her down with my car oh my god <laughs> my dad telling the principal this in it's person. amazing <laughs> um and and sure enough next day i went back and i was in a different classroom oh um so i ended up going over to mr carswell's classroom who was like a first year teacher young guy super energetic uh and that's where i i lived out the rest of the school year Everyone loved Mr. Carswell. I remember that. He was very fun. He was a great guy. And, and then he, um, in fact, him and I, not say stayed close, but we stayed connected because his wife was a medical rep mm. at the hospital where my dad worked. And so they would come to like our Christmas parties and stuff. That's why I remember him better than because I didn't have him in fifth grade. So I, I don't know why I remembered him so well. But yeah, so I get, I get to see Mr. Carswell every year or two. I remember bringing him being at a party at your house. Yeah. And I, I want to say, because like, there's a big thing now where a lot of people are kind of moving against helicopter parents and how it's always the teacher's fault and never the kid's fault these days and how that's, you know, be overcorrected in the wrong direction. And I agree with a lot of that because, you know, my, my girlfriend and my sister are both teachers and they've had to deal with like parents making huge excuses for their kids who are literally acting terribly. But there are legitimate things that teachers do that are completely unreasonable and do need to be called out. And I think it's a value judgment and not always assuming your kid is in the right. But I think your dad saw all the circumstances around that incident was like, no, this is bullshit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, the other thing, I was I wasn't a kid who got in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was not a kid that had ever been sent to the principal's office. I'd never gotten detention. Mm. You know, and so it was one of those things where he's like, no, that's just not. No. Now, I, I had some instances where I think my mom was overprotective of my sister and myself, but also times where I think she was pretty legitimate in her arguments against what was going on. Like, I think I might have even told this story on the podcast before, but I um, I had dropped out of some course or something. No, I guess what it was. I couldn't get a elective I wanted last minute in middle school, I believe it was. And so the only elective left was called reading. And it was typically an elective that people who needed help reading would take, which I was not one of those people. <laughs> I, I mean, like I think extra study time kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, you're there. You're assigned books remediately to read uh, and do like little easy reports on them. And um, and I think Steve and I both read a lot when we we're younger, probably a lot more than we read oh, now. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't need to be taking that course. And I think I acted out in that class or something like that. And I will give these really dumb presentations. I wouldn't read the material because it was just like I was this is a waste of my time. And so uh, I, I, she, I got in trouble. And I think my mom did complain to the teacher. But then at the same time, they came to an agreement that um, it was I shouldn't be in that class. And that's kind of why it was happening. And they talked through it. But she was this teacher was teaching these things to mostly kids who didn't need reading help. And so it's kind of the school's fault that they had this class that was really dumbed down for people who didn't need things to be dumbed down and so it was a waste of time but that happens a lot um but through i don't remember a lot of teachers throughout middle school there's only a few that stick out so what's like some of the middle school teachers that you remember um so the one i remember and this also is is uh, a memory of a class i shouldn't have been in <laughs> simultaneously so both of the same thing i think her name was miss hartwell i remember that name she was a, a real sweet older lady um, and I remember I had her for sixth grade science in sixth period. Gotcha. And I remember walking into the classroom and realizing that there was almost no one in there. Cause at our middle school, you know, we probably had 30 kids a class easy. Yeah. Right? It's a pretty big school. I walk in, there's like 10 other kids. 
And I'm like, oh, this is weird. Mm -hmm. And then she goes over the agenda and I'm like, oh, this seems easy. And then I realize I've been placed in an ESOL class. (laughs) Oh, no. English is a second language. Yeah. So I've been there with a bunch of Spanish speaking Latino kids. (laughs) How did that happen? I don't know. And neither did she. (laughs) Mind you, I had a real good time in that class. I got to know some people that I otherwise would not have gotten to know. True. But I remember she basically said something to the the academic coordinator and I was like, hey, we really need to get him into a real science. Like, not not say it wasn't a real science class, but it was geared to be slower and simpler uh, because it was ESOL. Right, right. Um, and there were like transitional language things that I didn't need. <laughs> like this, right? That's hilarious. So, so I was only in that class for a quarter, I think, before they rearranged my schedule to get me into a regular science class. <laughs> but I remember just walking in and when there were only 10 other kids, I went, something's up. Mm. <laughs> something's wrong here. <laughs> and they're not speaking my language <laughs> I'm in the twilight zone. So that was fun. And yeah. she was a, she was a good teacher and someone who I really liked. Well, that's good. I remember that name. And also, I had um, I'd mentioned Miss Mayer earlier. She was um, a social studies teacher, I believe. And I don't I feel so terrible that I said something so awful to her because I I really remember legitimately enjoying her class and thought she was a good teacher. And she taught she spoke to the, I always liked teachers through middle school and high school who spoke to us kind of like equals, not like hey I'm your buddy buddy friend, but as in they respected us and talked to us like a normal person and not like they were dumbing things down for us. And she was like that. She was very and she'd make jokes. She was fun. She made it interesting. And apparently she said something. Um, she was saying something angry or to to someone in class. And I responded with, what are you on your period or something? I can't believe I, (laughs) and like, first of all, that is sexist. That is, it's rude. It's out of character for me at that age. Like, but my, I remember I got um, sent to the principal's office. My mom heard about what I said. And so she still tells the story to this day. And I don't remember saying it. I, I must have done it because my mom remembers it very vividly. It's I just, she'll never forget the embarrassment of having to go to the principal's office. So for that kind of thing too. And I was like, why would I ever say something like that? Especially to a teacher I liked. So I, so if Miss Mayer's out there and ever hears this podcast, I am so sorry. Like, I don't know why I would ever say that. And I hope that didn't color your impression of me forever because I'm a good kid. Um, but then also I had Miss Sherman. She was my English teacher who my sister was two years behind me. So my sister and I shared a bunch of classes throughout the years and my sister hated Miss Sherman. Uh, they got in tons of fights. Uh, they would just argue over things. My sister corrected her once in class because Miss Sherman was also a young teacher at the time. But young for us back then, she seemed she could have been 90 years old. We wouldn't know the difference, but she was probably in her 20s. Um, and she wrote in the board the word hyperbole. And she was explaining what that means in, re- in relation to the English language, as you do in an English class. But she wrote up there and she goes, OK, so hyperbole is when you do this. And my sister raised her hand. She's like, um, it's pronounced hyperbole. <laughs> And the teacher got so angry with her that she corrected her and insisted that she was right for a while. Um, but that's. Uh, that- I also had Miss Sherman. Yeah. But it was. Do you remember in a middle school, we had like one class a month or something that was like homeroom? Yeah. And there were always weird things we did in there, like surveys and fcat prep but it was really weird and only happened like once a month realistically and i was in miss sherman's homeroom oh so you didn't have her for english i didn't have her for a real class i had her for weird homeroom whatever the hell that was (laughs) right well i remember i i had a um i got along with her very well and also was thought she was good looking stuff for my original hormones starting to form at that age i remember her being a very good looking teacher as well so that was the starts of a you know noticing those things as a youngster uh you're starting to notice when they have a young cute teacher that it's a, it makes things a little awkward because you know there's always those teachers throughout the years who you get a little distracted because they're wearing the you know the low-cut shirts and things like that which is terrible but we can't help it we're hormonal teenagers we're so. in middle school we, we have no it, filter at that point that's when it's the worst when you're in middle school <laughs> yeah everything's new and terrible uh so should we move on to high school sure so the first I was really trying to remember ninth grade because ninth grade for us was weird because of the ninth grade center. Yeah. For uh, listeners, they put us for some reason after we get out of junior high or middle school, as we call it here, we get put into instead of a high school immediately. 
our high school was like segregated for the ninth grade in one old the old high school building was in a completely different location of town. It was like two and a half miles away from the high school. Right. It was the ninth grade center. It's the old high school that they've now moved on and they put all the kids in this crappy building. It's so ancient and they call it the pink prison because it was pink painted house this, this pale, ugly pink. Oh, it was color. awful. But yeah, so we were segregated for ninth grade for some reason. But anyway. So I was really trying to remember like good teachers. And the only one that comes to mind is because he continued to be an influence. Uh, and I'll just refer to him as Mr. H mm-hmm. who was the theater. Right. Teacher. And so I remember I took intro to acting with him and, you know, ninth grade, I went and auditioned for my first play and he is the one who gave me my first role, like in a real show. Yeah. That's uh, even though thing. I completely botched the audition and he continued to be a very big formative part because he was the theater director for years for me. Yeah, it's like you very infrequently have teachers over many years and you're that part of schooling. So we get to know these either, you know, chorus or drama teachers for very well after over those years. Yeah. Um, but the one time I'm not going to say he f- failed me. But it was ninth grade. And uh, we were doing this show by the skin of her teeth. Mm-hmm. Your teeth, our teeth, skin of their teeth, your teeth. Yeah, you were someone's teeth, by the skin of someone's teeth. <laughs> Um, and the kid who had was supposed to be the lead got a big head and really pulled a dick move and like dropped out last moment. This, this show that had basically been chosen for him. Oh, wow. Be the lead dropped out. And so like on the last day of auditions, all of a sudden we needed to find a new lead for the spring show. And there were four of us that were up, up for it. And I was one of them, which as a ninth grader was incredibly intimidating. Yeah. But I had the height and the stage presence to do it. That had I not had, there's no way I would have been up for it. Uh, and that was actually the, another person that was up for it. And someone we ended up buddying around with was a guy named Dan H who was another very big, boisterous gentleman. Absolutely. I love Dan H. He was great. That was where I met Dan H was. He was another person that was being forced into this audition for this lead role. (laughs) Just a fun guy. Very fun. guy. Uh, And then another guy, another little guy who I don't remember. And then this kid named Kelly. And I don't remember his last name. So I'm going to call him Kelly. And he was in the orchestra and a senior, but had never done any acting. It was very green. Hmm. And so we went through a couple rounds of, of auditions and it was down to me and him, which was extra intimidating because Dan had been cut and this other guy had been cut. And Mr. H said, thank you guys. Can you guys wait out in the hall? And me and this, this guy, Kelly, go out and wait in the hall and him and the cast that had already been cast. Cause as I said, this guy dropped out. So the rest of the show was cast, right? Sat in and discussed who they shot, thought should have the role. Oh, wow. With, with the other students. Right, right, because they were already cast. There was not, a, there was no mystique about it. They were who I was going to be acting with, and he walked out and sort of gave us a smile and a nod and headed to his office and went in and closed the door. And me and this kid Kelly sat there, and everyone else left, and we sat there for fifteen or twenty minutes, huh. like not knowing what had happened, and just getting more and more nervous. And I remember Mr. H came out of his office clearly to like go home for the day. And he goes, oh, did they not tell you? And it was the thing where he expected the cast to tell us, to let one of us down. The heck? Instead oh. of doing it himself. Oh. And to this day, I hope it was a big misunderstanding. Like, I hope it was some I good miscommunication. But I remember just being so disappointed in that moment. Because, A, I didn't get it. So that was disappointing. Oh, well, but then oh, to, yeah. to get like kind of offhandedly told. I didn't get it was an extra like ah kick in the nut. I see. To be fair, he he is kind of he was kind of a strange eccentric kind of flighty guy. So um and it wasn't in his character to be mean, really. No, no, so no. It's it, it might have been just a misunderstanding or him just being like totally space brain for a while. <laughs> um but yeah, like and then I acted for him in multiple shows after that. Yeah. And he had some crazy moments. Like I remember him exploding yeah, he did have explosions occasionally. A handful of times. Mm-hmm. Once per show, you could expect <laughs> at least a, one good blow up. An explosion, if you will. <laughs> what do you remember about Mr. H? Well, I, 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 as we might have said in the show before, but Steve uh, is the one who got me into theater because uh, they also had another show where 
they were going to cast this guy. The we'll, same kid. Yeah, the we'll, same kid. We'll call him Chet Friendly. About. We'll call him Chet Friendly. Chet uh, Friendly. <laughs> and Steve knows why. Um, Chet Friendly, just this big ego kid who he actually got a couple little tiny movie roles uh, that made him think he was the hottest shit in the world. Um, and he was not very nice to other people. Uh, and they cast, they were going to have him in this play and he dropped out again. Um, I think to film the big movie that he was going to be in actually, mind you, he was incredibly talented. He was, he was very wrong. Yep. Pretty mostly for our age group and our little pond, you know, he was a very talented guy. Um, and, but the, now they're suddenly missing a lead to the play for uh, Harvey, this play that you've, there was a movie of it with, um, Jimmy Stewart and a big, a big rabbit that doesn't exist. Same deal. Mr. H just says, all right, who do you guys know? Yeah. <laughs> Just start bringing people in. <laughs> so he brings in me, Steve, uh, and has me audition. I don't know how I auditioned or what I read or I don't because I don't remember. You didn't have anything prepped. Certainly. I don't I think, think you read so. some scenes. I must have. And the thing was, is my confidence wasn't very high at that point. I think that served me well because I was a skinny, tall, white guy. I mean, I kind of resembled in my demeanor, maybe at the time, kind of close to what he might be thinking for Jimmy Stewart. Um, and so that kind of probably worked out in my favor to have this kid <laughs> with no experience in acting suddenly, besides little dumb movies that you and I would have worked on through middle school and high school. <laughs> and uh, so I got the part and I got into that with the theater department. And uh, so I actually uh, used that as part of my college essay to get into Boston University was writing about Mr. H and him taking a chance on this little skinny, uh, nervous kid. And it gave me the confidence to go forward and do a lot of other things, not all all because of Mr. H, but because that little kind of spiraled things in motion for me to be the person I am today. So it's it helped me get into college. So I got to be thankful to him for that. Absolutely. And follow up story there. Chet Friendly <laughs> uh, did go on to be the lead in the next show that year. Yes. Uh, and I remember it came to the like end of the year theater awards. And you beat him out for like lead male for best actor. I have that best award actor. somewhere in this house. <laughs> you beat him out for best actor. And I remember he was pissed and it was only because he had like, he had effectively burnt so many bridges. Yeah. He made so many people upset and yeah. upset so many people in the department that, that even, even if he was objectively better or such that you're like, right. He wasn't going to win. He just made too many <laughs> enemies that year. It just wasn't going to happen. That's just plain old politics, man. Right there. <laughs> and um, Steve and I were pretty much friends with everybody, uh, especially the base of everyone and the normal people in, in drama, not the the celebrity people in drama. So we were the we were the friendly guys everyone got along with. So we are going to vote for things, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Mr. Mr. H sort of set it all off. Some mentions here of some of the bad of that's when high school started to happen. So I didn't have a lot of bad teachers in elementary or middle school that I remember. I had some that couldn't handle things and were I remember walking into closets crying. Um, and I can only feel for them because I know the anxiety and stress that goes with that job. And we weren't even recognizing anxiety and stress that much back then. So I'm, you know, so sad for those teachers that these kids would make cry and run into a closet. Hopefully I was never one of those kids. But uh in High school, I definitely had one that I remember in particular, and I've, I think I've also mentioned her on this podcast before because of similar topics, but my Spanish teacher, Miss T, I'll call her, uh, mm -hmm. she just was ruthlessly mean, negative, always in a bad mood, and just seemed like she hated being at her job and was short and unforgiving with every student that she had. I don't think she would have inspired anyone to keep learning Spanish, which was the topic. Um, and it's just, it's just, I don't know why teachers like that are, exist in the field. I get you have bad days, but if you have every day is a bad day, like for your own mental health, you shouldn't be there. Um, not just for the students, but for yourself, you're going to die early because of your stress. So I don't know. Have you had someone like that? That was just relentlessly terrible. <laughs> um, maybe not terrible, terrible, but I had a couple of teachers that were less than stellar. Certainly. Uh, another one of mine was also a foreign language teacher. Mm. I'll call him Madame B. Yeah. Uh, and her issue was that is that she taught two different languages at the time. She taught French and Spanish and she spoke Portuguese. Impressive. It was super impressive. But I remember she would screw up and tell us the wrong tensing for verbs. Like she oh. would tell us Spanish tensing 
instead of French. And then we would get things wrong. And the whole class would be like, that is what you taught us. <laughs> and she would, she would just deny it up and down. I remember she gave us not say unfair tests, but tests that there's no way we could have been prepared for. It was like, so study all the verbs, study their conjugations and know how to write a couple of sentences. And then I remember the final test, it, every question was in French. Oh gosh. And it was multiple choice. She's like, but I think I've put enough clues in <laughs> that you should be able to know what the, and I remember it was just something that, that she in no way prepared us for. Oh. And for it to be the final, it was extra mind boggling. That's just, uh, um, I think she was overwhelming herself with too much at one time on her yeah. plate. So Madam B was just confusing and, and kind of all over the place. Uh, I'm going to call him Mr. M. Oh, uh, who was a young guy fresh out of college. I think this was his first or second year teaching. And Mr. M's thing was that he wanted to become a secret service agent. Hmm. So he did crazy like triathlete things and marathon, multiple marathons a year and these Ironman things. But then part of that also is apparently, I don't know if this is actually true, but I remember him telling us at the time that the secret service recruits very heavily out of law school graduates. Right. And so he was at the time, his year with us was his year to prep for the LSAT. Like we were a way station on his way to going to law school and then getting to be in the secret service. Oh, lovely. So he really cared to be there. He did not care. <laughs> <laughs> um, but same deal. Like he just, he wasn't, I remember him missing copious amounts of class. Oh, geez. Uh, I remember him having us take practice LSATs. What? In class. What was the topic of the class? Questions with us. It was English. It was 10th grade English. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and so that was just like, you know, the sort of the definition of a teacher that you couldn't feel was invested. Right. And I don't need a teacher to be, you know, the most inspirational teacher every time, but, you know, at least at least care to be you're doing your job well. You know, that's the minimum, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. I know you don't get paid well enough. They need to be paid more, but still don't be there if it's just because it's, you're forming kids lives here. It's kind of important. Um, uh, and those are the ones I kind of remember is the more the more negative ones. Oh, those two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I will say my top teachers I had were probably in my, um, you know, gifted classes that were in high school, which was it's kind of weird because they're basically the kind of the same as the AP courses. But they they just focused less, which is nice, focused less on work and studying and tests and more on discussions and creative activities. That's what us gifted kids are good at. And we you know, typically aren't very good at tests, actually. But um, so we would have discussions in my English classes I, over two years, I think seventh and eighth grade. My sister had the same two teachers, um, and Miss Hurley. I'll say her name because I'm Facebook friends with her. If she comes on, hey, Miss Hurley. Um, it's weird being <laughs> Facebook friends with your teachers now. But she had my sister and I, and it's just, it just was one of the first courses where we sat down and talked about books, and kids were allowed to say things like, that book was really boring. And she was totally cool with discussing that and saying that's a valid point because she could tell that you read the book. And that's okay. You read the book, you did the assignment, but now we can talk about why do you think it's boring? What made it boring and uninteresting? And we were saying like, we turn our tables like in a circle and we'd all be just discussing it. And that was my first kind of moment when in high school where I was like, I'm learning in a very like um, organic way. And this is not just studying for a test. And it was kind of neat that I was just like, oh, this is happening naturally, <laughs> which is kind of neat. I don't know if you had a course like that in high school, or if you had to wait till college to have that, because most of that was in college for me, not in high school. Uh, for me, the teacher I had, and this is actually another one of those rare cases where I got to have a teacher two times in a row. Oh, uh, his name, and I'll say his real name because I'm sure he's still teaching, but this is all positive. Mr. Hansen, he taught yeah. Uh, world history. My sophomore year, and I really enjoyed his class. He was very engaging. I remember we did Jeopardy to get ready for tests. <laughs> nice. Um, and his, but his class was very straightforward in that he didn't try to pull curveballs on you. He was very much in the text. So you knew what to study for. You knew to like look at the important people, look at the important definitions and understand a little bit. Like he really, he, he didn't try to make it a tricky or crazy class. He just wanted to engage us. Yeah. Uh, and then I got lucky enough the next year he got moved up to 11th grade U S history. Oh. And I had him the next year in the same time frame, second period, 
in the same classroom and I had the same seat because alphabetically I was still sitting in the same place. <laughs> nice. Consistency. So two years in a row, I had like a consistent history experience. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I remember he was always talked about as being like a fun, nice teacher to have, and which I'm jealous because you've had a lot of male teachers over the course of your your school career. I didn't have a single male teacher outside of, of ex- electives, basically. I hmm. have, So, yeah, I, it just worked out that way. I never had a male teacher. Um, not that I need to, but it's just like – Oftentimes, you're looking for, you know, nice male figures mixed in with your female figures growing up. And I didn't have any of that. So lucky for you. Uh, so, yeah, Mr. Hansen, just consistency, I guess. Uh, <laughs> another another great teacher I had that I still remember very fondly uh, was Coach Hill, who taught geometry. Mm. And he was the cross country coach. Yeah, I remember him. And we had a big cross country program, a very, a very high ranking cross country program at Winter Park. Oh, for yeah. That matter. Uh, and I just remember I, I was in at some point I decided I don't need to be in advanced math. Oh yeah. I think I, I can be choice. in regular math. I'm taking <laughs> advanced everything else. I can be in regular math. I don't need this. <laughs> and in re- in regular math, there were a handful of kids that clearly could have been taking advanced math, but didn't. <laughs> and so I was in this class of like regular kids, except for me and two other slacker guys, basically. <laughs> Uh, one of which was uh, somebody we piled around with, Neil, mm-hmm. um, who is still to this day one of the wittiest and smartest people I've ever met. Yeah. Like, I still think of him as very witty and very smart. He was very and quick on his kid, feet. Alex, who him and I had hung around, piled around in sixth, seventh grade. And he was very smart, but very sarcastic and sort of dour. And Coach Hill very quickly realized that we didn't belong there. <laughs> And so he would joke with us in a way that he wouldn't joke with the other kids. And um, the two jokes I remember coming out of that class uh, was he was telling us about Chief Sokotoa and the right angle teepees. Yeah. Because so, sine, cosine, tangent. And it was this like analogy oh, to help yeah. us remember it. Uh, and I remember a girl in the class raised her hand and said, Coach, were there really right angle teepees? And Neil, without skipping a beat, blurted out, if they had them, we burnt them. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. And and me and this other kid and coach, like, lost it because it was so sardonic and irreverent. Oh, my Um, God. Oh, wow. Oh, man. That's really funny. They had them. We burned them. That's the thing is, like, you don't think of kids being that clever, but, like, my girlfriend's a middle school teacher and a theater middle school teacher, and she does – overheard in hearts class because that's her last name and she would she writes down the things that her kids have said i'm like a kid that age really said that that is hilarious and you don't realize that like (laughs) these smart brains that are going to be create very smart adults they're still they're really starting to form at that age and becoming really intelligent and so these things can really happen and come out of the mouths of babes and just but neil was a particularly intelligent funny guy he was yeah he was still to this day i think of him as like one of the smartest people i've ever met in my life (laughs) especially that's quick brain not to necessarily force you moving into college, but I will say just probably when you watch movies like Dead Poet Society and movies like that that take place in colleges and there's like this academic feel on campus and there's books and learning and and you're striving for greatness and that kind of thing. One of the feeling of college I got from movies I actually had at school and college was with my one professor. Her name was uh, – Mrs. Uh, Miss Smith at the time, but now she's Kristen Bazayo. Mm-hmm. She's actually been on our podcast to play on nerds a while back talking about yeah, during a gamer gate gamer gate. Cause she's uh, her, her, her partner at the time was working in, I don't know if she's still with that same person, but uh, working at blizzard. Um, so she had known a lot about the gaming industry. She's been a long time gamer herself, a uh, big nerd as well, but she was um, getting her PhD at the, uh, the literature department at Boston university where I went to school and they're there for like seven years doing those PhDs, which I remember learning at the time. Like I'm never getting a PhD. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Um, but while you're getting your PhD, you teach the underclassmen. So you've already probably gotten masters. So you're definitely qualified to be teaching underclassmen um, at a university at that point, but not that much older than us. So, you know, we're probably 18 to 22 and she's probably uh, 25 at that point. Um, and she was teaching us like drama one and drama two, teaching us like the, you know, the classics of drama, theater, just history, that kind of thing. Um, and I got to have her for drama one and drama two over two semesters. And she also ran the 
um, a theater department on campus that only put on productions of Shakespeare's contemporaries, which I've told Steve about before. So basically all the writers who were writing plays at the same time as Shakespeare, but weren't Shakespeare. <laughs> so right. one of the more famous being like Christopher Marlowe and that kind of thing had plays that we did, we put on. And so, but we'd have, we'd have her for class, me and my, my two buddies. And then we'd afterwards, after class was over at the end of the day, we'd go to rehearsals with her and talk about uh, theater and literature and stuff. And it was just like, I felt so academic at that time and professorial talking about these things after school and like, you know, oh yes, let's talk about theater. And so it just felt very much this little bubble of life that I had there for a while in that little academic world. So that was kind of neat. So shout out to you, Kristen. It was awesome having you as a teacher and and she's also written many recommendations for me over the years, which I appreciate. So thank you for very that. Cool. Yeah. I mean for me for college, um, it's hard for me to remember professors that weren't in the theater department. Just because it was my major, I spent so much time there. Mm -hmm. um, and for those professors, even I don't. My memories of them aren't in classes; they're all in productions. Mm. Like I don't think back of like, oh man, theater history was really prolific for me. <laughs> yeah, I think back about uh, like Andrew Ryder, who still teaches, and I think is now the chair of theater at SPU. Uh, and I got cast in all four of his main stages. So I got to do four shows with him one a year for the entire time I was there and got to be the lead in the, the show that he cast me in senior year, uh, which was nice that he put that much trust in me. Um, but, you know, I remember him as a professor and as a director, always wanting you to answer your own questions, even at a point of exhaustion. Yeah. And even where I would want direction. Hey, should, do, you, do you think I should try to play this more angry? And he goes, well, what do you think? What would lead you there? And I remember just trying to get something out of him and getting really, really frustrated. And at the time being frustrated, but now looking back and seeing that he was attempting to give me the tools to do it myself. And maybe lead you the right direction. Right, right, right. But, and that that was what being the learning actor was all about at that stage. But I remember at the time being really, really annoyed that he wouldn't tell me if he wanted me to play it angrier. Right. And like, uh, I just got out of a play just recently with a really great director. Um, it was called wit. Um, and it was the first time I've worked with like a really full on, I think professional director. I've worked with a lot of directors over the year, but mostly amateur or through high school or college, um, that weren't necessarily professionals in their field. And every time she was giving an, a direction that she thought you want, she wanted something different from that scene. She would go to the actor. She's like, you know, where you said that line in scene three, uh, uh, and where you say, you say, uh, take out the trash. What do you think you mean by that? And then you can see the actor's eyes just turning and realizing, okay, I did something wrong, probably, or something she doesn't like. But she's, but <laughs> oh, she's no, what I do. But she's not going to tell me. She's like, well, what do you think I mean? Well, what do you want me to do differently? And she's like, well, what do you think your character really means by that? And then she just asks that question. And then three or four times, the actor's thinking about, oh, yeah, she probably means this by that line. <laughs> and the director goes, okay, and just walks away. <laughs> and she fixed the problem without actually telling her to do anything. So I think your director was doing exactly what good directors should be doing is just, you know, letting you get there on your own and, but still realizing there, there's something for their the fix of that situation. Uh, but then of course, at the other end of the spectrum, then I would have uh, Don who at the time was the theater department chair who would direct what were called the backstage shows, which were more like black box kind of shows. Yeah. Uh, and he always had an incredibly clear artistic vision in mm. his head. He knew what he wanted. And so part of sort of his mystique as a director was that he would get you on board. And so, yes, he would tell you like exact ways he wanted you to deliver things or exact ways he wanted you to move, but you, but you knew he had a vision. And so it became part of your drive to help fulfill it. So you, ha you had the signpost in front of you. It's like, oh, that's where I'm going with this. Okay. Gotcha. Right. right. Um, and so, but he was the sort of director. He would tell you the way he wanted you to say a line. Uh, um, a line reading and, and everything. Uh, sometimes occasionally he would get to that point where he would tell you like the inflection he wanted you to use. Right. Uh, and I remember, uh, my freshman year, I got cast in the backstage show and it was called the inner circle. And it was kind of like an aid school play, oh. like almost like a bad after school special <laughs> <laughs> truly. And so he cast me as a high school kid. Oh, which even freshman year of college i was you know six foot two even freshman year of high school you weren't and robust <laughs> we'll say um and so i was definitely did not read it as a high school kid 
And I remember he cast me and I was really surprised I got it. And we went into the first day of rehearsals and I'm reading lines. He goes, can you do it higher? And I went, what, what do you mean? Oh yeah. He told me about this. (laughs) And he, he wanted me to do my voice higher and more nasally. And so I went from like being me performing as me to playing. I'm Danny. Uh, Mark, get out of here, man. I don't want you in my life anymore. And I, I became AIDS. this like in a very, what was, should have been a very serious kind of show. I became this caricature. Oh, but he, but it was what Don wanted. Maybe and that so vision was misguided. <laughs> and plus I was a freshman. So I was just happy to be there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'll do whatever you say, man. Fine. Well, he's a high voice. But yeah. So I did this whole show about AIDS like this. Yeah. Oh, I got AIDS. Um, Well, I had an acting teacher that I can't, I will never remember the name of because it was for one course over a semester, but it was pretty much my first acting class at BU because we took drama classes, I took film classes, but then I took my one and only kind of acting course at BU. And it was with this undergraduate, um, no, he was master's class. He was the MFA at the acting program at BU. And I'll just remember from that class, he wasn't necessarily a wonderful teacher or anything, but we had this one moment that I've heard this advice ever since for new actors. We were doing, we had to say these lines to each other. We're sitting across from someone, an Indian style on the floor, and you're staring into their eyes, and you have to say these lines back and forth to each other. And the point was to get you to say it in a natural and honest way and not in an acting or performative way. And that's it. I had a little breakthrough moment at that time because I was like, oh, I'm, I'm just supposed to say this. Like I would be saying it normally to a person in front of me. Oh, and then I don't know why it's so simple, but most new actors just can't get that through their head. You're sounding like you're performing. Why do you sound like that? Say these words exactly how you would be doing it, talking to someone really in front of you. And it seems so obvious, but it's so hard to drop that facade and that this performative nature of, of speaking. And now every kind of coach or acting class I've taken since they've all had to remind me of that same thing. And that's the same exact advice over and over again is, Talk like someone's sitting right next to you and don't talk like you're talking to an audience. Um, so, yeah, that was a big moment in, in college there for that teacher. So whoever that grad student was, thank you, <laughs> whatever your name was. Um, I think my version of that and the few times this wasn't even I can, can't even attest it to a specific director, but it was always a bugaboo of mine. <laughs> uh, and the few times I directed and coached and did that sort of stuff for underclassmen, this is what I came up with, which was the, the I hate the actor's whisper. Oh, I remember you mentioning this, but what is it Which again? Is, it's where at, and actors all over the place do this and you'll hear it. And what they think they're getting really intense. <laughs> they'll be like, no, Brad, you can't come in here. And they think they're getting intense, <laughs> but they're just getting breathy and like whispering. And I'm like, when in your life have you gotten really intense and emotional and started talking like this to someone? <laughs> it's never happened. That's right. Ever. Right. Stop it. If you want a line to be intense, make it intense, but stop doing the actor's whisper. Oh, no one talks yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Cause I, I, I've been listening to other audiobook narrators. I'm editing now for other uh, audiobook narrators as well. And I'll hear some of them, like, which gets me, it bothers me every time. Cause I think it's actually a style that some narrators are fine with. And apparently some listeners are fine with where I heard this line the other day. Um, Come sit down, enjoy us at the ta- enjoy dinner at the table, he proclaimed. Like, that is a pro- proclamation? Okay, well, that's fine. Um, how dare you, he growled. That wasn't a growl. <laughs> like, that, that's exactly how they say it. I'm like, you're not in, in, even insinuating what the next line of dialogue says you're supposed to sound like. And it's right there in front of you. <laughs> so, it, and then some listeners don't mind. They're like, does, they want someone to just tell the story and not really give any in more inflections past that, which I can't do. I just can't fathom that in my narration. So one of the most um, interesting acting books I ever read was by David Mamet. Oh yeah. The, the prolific playwright uh, called true and false. And his whole, his whole shtick on acting is like act as little as possible. Your job as the actor is not to interpret or extrapolate my words. Your job as the actor is to say the lines in a way that the, that the audience can hear and understand them and do as little motion as possible while conveying the story. Uh, <laughs> so he wants his plays done. <laughs> you, it was, yeah, his whole thing is like, you are my tool. I am the playwright. 
That book is literally sitting on the top of my bookcase right now. <laughs> He's got a very like like actors are trash kind of view of acting. <laughs> <laughs> Your job is to say the words I wrote the way I wrote them. That makes sense for his plays. If you've watched uh, any of the movie versions of his plays and or seen any of his plays live, they're just a lot of talking, a lot of dialogue. You got to get it out there. And he's very funny. So he doesn't want you messing that up, I guess, with all your yeah. s- silly timing and such. <laughs> yeah, silly timing and inflections. Now you don't know that you're going to say the words and make sure the audience can understand them. Because he's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross as well, right? That's what's him. So that's so, yeah. a good example of a movie to watch that he's crazy dialogue. Oh, but anyway, so that's those all. aren't even teachers. Those are just lessons I learned. <laughs> we, we, we spawned off on that, but I, the I, actors whisper is bullshit. And no one talks <laughs> like that. And if you're going to act, just talk like you're talking to a real person. Um, and I'll just honorary mention to some teachers in my life. Uh, my, also my stepsister, uh, stepsister-in-law, I would say, uh, Katie, she's also been a teacher this whole time. She's amazing. She loves her job. She's good at it. And my sister, as I mentioned before, and my lovely girlfriend. So just there's so many teachers in my life and my half sister as well. Half sister in law uh, has been a teacher. She's been an administrator. She's been on school boards and such. She's uh, so there are teachers all over around in my life and they're amazing. Support your teachers, folks. Yes. Get them to be paid more. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> so I guess does that conclude this episode of the Sappy Crap podcast? I think it does. All right. Join us next time when we talk about something so interesting that we haven't even decided what it is yet. Oh, yeah. So thanks for joining us in this delightful stumble down memory lane. And don't forget, the good old days weren't always that good. This podcast was brought to you by A Play on Nerds.